liturgy comes from a Latin word and a Greek word. The Latin word socius, which is a Latin adjective meaning sharing, accompanying, acting together, allied, in common. And then you've got the, the Greek word logion, which is, means the results of study and analysis. So sociology is the study of people coming together, living together. That's pretty all it is in, in basic terms, all right? Now, the Christian sociality begins with what? A family, father, mother, children. It resulted from the father and mother coming together, husband and his wife. From this union comes children, and children build a community, a community, a village, a village, a city, on and on and on and on and on, okay? Thus, for the Christian and for our Western culture, and in particular the, for the foundational Judeo-Christian culture of the United States, our spiritual biblical roots run very deep in all aspects of our society, and especially so with the family. However, there are groups today that are challenging the very core of the family as we know it, okay? The most significant aspect about Christian sociology is the fact that man is viewed as a fallen individual from the initial state of perfection that God created him in. That is, in common parlance, man is utterly corrupt because of his sin nature that enveloped him as a result of his disobedience to God in Genesis 3. And Jesus came and died for us. We have salvation through him. Thus, the Christian sociological paradigm sees man as a fallen and corrupt sinner who is fully responsible for his actions and choices. And even though events, culture, and value systems may have affected one's life as he or she grew up. Now, we've talked about this several times, but listen to this. The appeal to victimization will never bring about spiritual, mental, and emotional wholeness to an individual and in turn to a community, but rather victimization will only prolong, intensify, and ingrain one's self-destructive lifestyle, lifestyle into a habitual identity. Now, I'm less than nothing, but that's what God gave me. And I think that is an accurate representation of what victimization does. I grew up with a man who never got out of bed. He ultimately became an alcoholic and had great effect on my life, caused great anger in uh, my life. And it took God breaking me, seeing my sin and seeing his forgiveness as I forgave a father. And I moved from being a victim. I didn't even know I was a victim. Didn't even know I had that mentality until that happened. And I moved from being a victim to a perpetrator. That's huge. In other words, realizing you also are a victim. Thank you, Mother. You want to say that because they can hear it? Just you say it. I, say it again, but you said it so good. Say it again now. Yes. We're all perpetrators, not just Yes, right. We, that is such an incredible, important aspect of looking at our lives when we come, you, because we don't think about that. But when you move from a victim to a perpetrator, you see that you affect other people. Because if you're a victim, everything's about you. You don't see anything that you do to other people. All you do is see what's been done to you. Are you with me? Amen. So this is huge. All right. That identity will in turn feed off of a narcissist, the victimization, narcissistic self-pity, which in turn will be aimed at pleasing oneself at the expense of others, and that will spread to others who will also be focus, focusing on pursuing self-deifying and self-destructive lifestyle. So that's basically what is, I think, is huge there, all right? Uh, in Christian sociology, the individual is the primary focus who in turn becomes a part and takes part of the community. Let us look down here in Hebrews 10. This is why fellowship is important. You know, a lot of people who are believers, they don't go to church. They're feeding on their own narcissistic victimization many times. Oh, I don't need church. Oh, the people have this, the people have that. And, and I've heard people say, I said, 
well, do you think maybe you are too? Well, oh, blah, 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 blah. I said, do you don't see what you do to other people? Blah, blah. Oh, they don't like that. Isn't that amazing? Because they think they've arrived. That's part of our, even as believers, understand, we have this body of flesh. That's the whole process. We're saved by the grace of God and his righteousness Amen. only. But when that begins, the process of sanctification and breaking and breaking and breaking and breaking so that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. And we move from being a victim to a perpetrator. That's painful. Yes. Dying to self is painful. If I said anything else, I'd be lying to you. Okay. All right. Yes, okay, I just got the, Oh, yeah, I've, I lost my place here. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. That word stimulate means also encourage, but also means to lovingly confront people when there's sin, when there's failure, when there's mistake. Are you with me? Because all of us are flawed, skewed people. I'm at the apex. My, my wife can tell you that. Stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking Ooh. our own assembly together. Now stop right there. Already in the early church, you see this, which, which what he says is, is the habit of some. Can you believe this was written in the first century, around 70, 80 AD, they don't know when, but sometime in there. And by that length of time already, there were people, oh, I don't need to go to church. I mean, I don't need the fellowship. Ladies and gentlemen, what I am telling you this morning, you ever heard people say, oh, I wish I was back in the early church? Well, you are right now. You're just like everybody was back then. You know, they have this idea, oh, it's just, ooh, this super spiritual thing. No, they were flawed, skewed people exactly as we are today. Now, revival, whenever revival takes place, like, say, with Calvary Chapel, anything like that, Great, it happens, but then everything settles back down into the same way. It has to be a new revival. Because as people, we are flawed, skewed people. And I'll say this again. If our salvation was dependent on our works, it's not a one of us here would make it. Because as you grow closer to the Lord, real spirituality is seeing what a flawed, skewed person you are, but that you fully stand in God's grace and the only righteousness you have is His. You have nothing to boast of. Okay. When you don't know really what you are, you think you're pretty good. You haven't seen squat. You haven't seen anything. You don't know. You know, you haven't learned. All right. So to simulate one another <clears throat> uh, to love and good deeds, not forsaking as some is, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Encouraging us. Huge. Okay. So we see then that the church and fellowship is huge. Now, Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. I'm not going to read that whole thing. But you see on there, look what I did. I put in there, you singular, you plural. Let me just read why. Came out after the death of Moses, servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, you, Joshua, rise, you cross the Jordan, you and this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel, every place on which the sole of your foot treads, meaning all y'all. In the South, we spell that Y A apostrophe L L. <laughs> so, the point I'm putting in here, you see the singular, but you see the plural. Are you with me? Ladies and gentlemen, we are individually responsible to God, but we are collectively as a group needing to come together. Does that make sense? Listen, there are many times. <coughs> when I came here, I was blessed greatly by your pastor. I was been blessed by Brother Ruben. But there have been times I've gone to churches, and I'll listen to a pastor, and okay, all right. And I just open my Bible up, and I start, uh, I'll listen to something he says, he says something, open my Bible up, and the Holy Spirit really starts ministering to me. Are you with me? Yes. Oh, I don't get anything out of church. That's all because you're not putting anything into it. 
When I go to church, I'm sitting there, and the, and the message may be something that's not directly, but the Holy Spirit will say something, boom, I open my Bible up, and I start reading it. And God ministers to me powerfully. Are you with me? Yes. Then we get up, we pray with people. So what I'm just saying to you, church is about fellowship. It's not about coming and, uh, you know, uh, adulating one man. Let me just add a comment about that real quickly here. I told you all, God developed in me as a young man critical speaking. Okay, I, in my senior year and at Mississippi State before the senior year went to a day practice, I was speaking at a youth revival at the First Baptist Church of Quitman, Mississippi. Ladies and gentlemen, that's about as Southern Baptist as you can get, about as non-Pentecostal charismatic as you can get. But God sovereignly, while I was there, that week filled me with the Holy Spirit and I received the gift of tongues. It was amazing. But I understood it because I'd been studying about it. I realized I hadn't arrived. I hadn't reached this special point. I was so much better than other people. I was realized the gift, but it was a deeper realization of God's presence and power. I got up and spoke that night and about 25 kids came to Christ. All right? Now, what happened though, I get back to college, get finish up my senior year, graduate, we go down to Jackson, end up in New Orleans Baptist Seminary. I'd never been around real Pentecostal stuff. Never been around it. I never really been a crazy, the crazy charismatic stuff. But then I started hitting it. And I was at seminary and these Baptist guys, oh, the Pentecostal, blah, 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 blah. And I said, no, that's not the correct. I said, this is what the Bible has to say. All they were judging, and this is where it comes in the critical and analytical thinking, is what they were seeing. And there were literally people, I'd never seen that until this one time, where people were running around the church, fall over chairs on them, and it happened. It's crazy. But that's all they had. And I just kept going back to this and this and this and this. And finally, one guy would say, well, W.A., it means W.A. Crystal, great man of God, love the Lord, a solid conservative a man of God, but he was a cessationist. And he was just a mere man like all of us. They said, well, W.A. says blah, 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 blah. Now, this was back in 1973. This was back in the fall of 73, right now, okay? I mean, in the spring when I was getting ready to graduate. And I said, well, W.A. is just a mere man. When I said that, you would have thought that I said Jesus Christ was born of a prostitute. Because they looked at that man as being the grip of truth. Same thing happened here, and it's happened in other places. We have our iron sharpening out thing. Typically, sometimes they'll feed us here. Sometimes we go to Richie's. We had Richie's been a couple of years back. I don't know about 10 or 12. I don't know if you were there, uh, Rick, at that time or not. There's about 10 or 12 guys who were sitting there eating, and they were all talking about uh, Pastor Chuck Smith. I love Chuck. Listen, Chuck blessed our family, reached out to me. I, I thank God for him. And God did a work through his life, incredible, as, he, as God did a breaking in his life and so forth. But he was just a mere man like all of us, all right? My theological training and learning did not come under him. I came there because this man happened to believe as I believed, and that was what was exciting. It's a couple of things we differed on some things. But these guys were saying, oh, Pastor Chuck, blah, blah, just Chuck this, Chuck that, Chuck this, Chuck that, came to me. What about you, Justin? I said, well, I love and appreciate Pastor Chuck greatly, but I never did really learn anything theologically from him. Once again, you would have thought I said Jesus was born of a prostitute. I had great respect for him, but that's not where my learning and growth came from. Now, the point I'm making is this, and Rick certainly knows this, and, and Reuben would know this, is that people do that all the time. People have done that with Chuck Smith. People have done that with W.A. Crystal. People have done that with Billy Graham. People, all kinds of people. You really, And yet, you see those people denying and basically running from that. Chuck Smith started Calvary Chapel out of Foursquare because everybody was worshiping Amy Simple McPherson. I remember him telling the story. He went in there and cut out her picture in the hymnals because everything was focused on her. Are you with me? What am I saying? I'm saying this, ladies and gentlemen. Calvary Chapel, French Valley is not Pastor Rick Lancaster. Is it Rick? It's about Jesus. Hallelujah. He just happens to be here as a servant through whom God's speaking, but God, not Rick, is causing the increase. Am I right, brother? Amen. 
Same with me. I am a hair on the ward of a backside of a hog. I'm merely here as God is using me as an instrument to minister to you all. Are you with me? Folks, we're just mere workmen. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. So the fellowship, I must tell you, is essential. Home Bible studies are important. All these things like that that you do. Why? Because it's God coming together. I learn stuff all the time from people. I read a bunch of stuff, a bunch of languages. But I sometimes in my class, I have a student say, uh, Professor Alfred, blah, 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 blah. I say, my land's alive. I never thought about that. You follow what I'm saying? I've been in martial arts 36 years. How long have you been in it, CJ? 17. How many? 17. 17. I learned something from that. I mean, we were, it's about how to take a gun away. And that's the way I've always done it, blah, 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 blah. I already shared that. I don't know. My mother already said that. But we were doing it the other day, and he did this thing perfectly. I said, wow, that's a good move. I, that's, that's great for somebody who doesn't have size and all that kind of stuff. You never quit learning in anything you're in, period. Always, You haven't arrived. All right. Fellowship support. Moving on from there. All right. <clears throat> Go over there to page, uh, well, let's see. I have page 69 here. Let me see where it is with y'all. Oops. Uh, it's the consequently. Top of 69. It's the top of 69. There we go. As both the individual and the group are a central part of God's plan and purpose, and as we look at the reality of our lives throughout recorded history, we also see that who and what we are is a part of all of our lives, not only our personal relationship with Christ, but individually and in our families as well, but also as believers in our extended families, wow. Our church and evangelistic outreach, our work, schooling, recreation, politics, etc. In other words, our Christian worldview should govern what? Yeah. Every aspect of our lives, period. Go down there to the quote about Bonhoeffer. One of the most significant uh, Christian pastors of the 20th century was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German Lutheran pastor killed by in a Nazi prison camp during World War II. Bonhoeffer was committed to following and obeying Christ to the death, and he did. He made no distinction between the sacred and the secular with regard to our involvement as Christians in all aspects of life. He saw all of life as sacred. Guys, that is an absolute, I never forget reading him. I said, this man thinks like I do. That's what God made that real to me. Listen, I love to go do trap shooting. So how, many of know, how many of you don't know what trap shooting is? Okay, very good. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> These are little bitty clay pigeons like this. They're not really pigeons. They're just clay discs. And you stand there. You have these five positions. You have a thing out there, and it shoots these things out, and you shoot them, bam, 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 bam. I love doing that. I love shooting, period. But when I go there, I pray every time before I go, Lord, use me as a witness. And it's amazing that God does. I work out at the gym. I go there, Lord, use me as a witness. I'm involved in the martial arts. I pray, Lord, just everything we do, I don't care what kind of work you're in, that's where God's placed you to be a living witness of Jesus Christ. If you're a mechanic and you're dealing with grimy sludge all in cars, yet there are other guys working around you. They're going to watch you. Are you with me? That's what's important. Okay. Let's read what Bonhoeffer had to say here. Okay. Bonhoeffer explains, it is God's will that there shall be labor, marriage, government, and church in the world, and it is his will that all these, each in its own way, shall be through Christ, directed towards Christ, and in Christ. Wow. This means that there can be no retreating from a secular into a spiritual sphere. Ladies and gentlemen, do we have in political involvement? Without question. If you live and breathe and walk around in this city, you're involved in the political scheme because they have all kinds of laws and pervert everything. Are you with me? Yes. We are a witness for Jesus Christ in every venue, okay? This means, as I just read that, Bonhoeffer makes it clear that no aspect of society lies outside the realm of Christianity. All society, indeed all of life, is bound inextricably with God and his plan for the world. 
In Bonhoeffer's view, the, the world is relative to Christ. Just excise that Ibid thing. Don't even worry us down here in the footnote. Thus, from our, from our personal relationship with Jesus to our family to the rest of the world beyond our family in all venues, we are called upon to be the salt and light that a decaying and darkened world is desperately needing. But it is precisely in the first two vitally important areas of our lives, our relationship with Jesus first and our family second, that we see the attacks of the God of this world aim. Big time. So as we come to this perspective of realizing this is where the battle is aimed, the quote there, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's, it's about all of that. <clears throat> Go down to the last paragraph. As we evaluate all of the above, we see that the Christian sociological worldview has God at the center through Jesus Christ and obedience to his word is the grid for our lives and our individual cultures and the world as a whole. It's not a question of if this is going to be challenged. It's only how, when, where, the intensity. The concept that we as believers should not become involved in the world around us, therefore, is pseudo-spirituality at best. And at worst, it is unequivocal cowardice and disobedience to God's word. It's an excuse for laziness and fear. Thus, by inaction to events surrounding us that are clearly unbiblical and exalt and proclaim evil as good and good as evil, or where our voice and involvement is needed as salt and light concerning issues in our community, state, and nation, we are, in essence, as believers, unequivocally negating Acts 1-8 if we don't want to be a part. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you shall go hide away and forget about all the other places. Just be at home with your family, and that's it. And you should be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. This last quote here is important. I want to read it. As humans, we might face the consequences for choices. Good, you're reading it. <laughs> we will face the consequences for choices we make in creating our society. God gave us the responsibility to protect and direct our societal institutions he ordains, including family, state, and church. Families are charged with reproductive responsibility as well as training and nurturing. The state is charged with carrying out justice primarily involving law and order. The church is charged with demonstrating Christian love within itself and inside is the Lord. We are answerable to God for the direction these institutions lead society. So here we are. We talked about that last night. You see churches embracing same-sex marriage, saying homosexual, can't do that. Anymore, if the church is at all, okay, it's okay if you have many adulterous relationships, or you have, well, that's fine. That's sick, too. Same way with addiction, saying, okay, it's okay if you drink a lot of alcohol and use marijuana and you get high and dope, that's okay. No, that's, that's destructive. But stealing, you don't go and steal, do you? Uh, so in your business, how you live your life, all these aspects, the laws that we see passed. Uh, one of the most deceptive pseudo-spiritual concepts is that we shouldn't get involved politically. Now, how much politically you want to get involved is your business. But ladies and gentlemen, if it hadn't been for our Christian forefathers, pastors getting involved in the country, we wouldn't have the First Amendment, let alone probably the rest of them. So you need to keep that in mind. All right, let's go down to Islam. Although Islam, like Christianity, also emphasizes the importance of relationship with God, the family, and the state as a foundational to any society and culture, their views of what it means to have a relationship with God, their family, and the state are radically different. Okay? Let's go down here and read this quote here from Surah 3335. For Muslim men and women, for believing men and women, for devout men and women, for true men and women, for men and women who are patient and constant, for men and women who humble, humble themselves, for men, for men and women who uh, give in charity, for men and women who fast and deny themselves, for men and women who guard their chastity, for men and women who engage much in Allah's praise for them, has Allah prepared forgiveness and great reward. What do you see in that? What? Exactly. Who said that? I heard somebody say it. Works. Works. 
It's exactly what you see. You do this, 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 and you deserve, consequently, as you do all these wonderful things, then you deserve blah, 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 blah. Because your works are so good. Keep that in mind. Because that blinds them. Many, listen, you can have the same thing. How many of y'all have ever been around holiness people? In the South, it's a big deal. Holiness people. I was around holiness young people that weren't very holy when I was in high school. But holiness can be very, very misdirecting and dangerous because it gives people an idea that I arrive at a place where I no longer have sin. This is a problem which is an absolute lie. Did I tell Pope about how I came to the Greek for then or not? Did I tell you all about when I was at Mississippi State, what happened or not? I don't remember. Okay, so here's what happened. I'm at Mississippi State. I was the leader of our Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Oh, this was Iron Sharp and the Iron, that's right. And so, my responsibility was to have a, a get a visiting pastor every month. We'd have an FCA group in our auditorium, I mean our, our cafeteria, and we'd speak and he'd speak and all that. So one of the guys said, "Just want you to invite Pastor Ba Ba Ba." I said, "Okay, where is he from?" He says, "He's from Holiness Church." I didn't know what Holiness. I just, you know, I said, "Okay." Guy comes and he picks up the King James version of the Bible out of First John three nine says, "Whoever is born of God does not sin." Now, we're just young athletes, okay? We're just come out of the world. He says, therefore, you can get to a place in your life where you no longer sin. And we're looking at him and we're looking at each other because we're all struggling and fighting and just with all we're going through. And he's, we all screwed up after that I meeting. We just said, what in the world did this guy say? Another dear friend of mine uh, who was from Jackson, Jackson area, played football up here with me, said, Justin, I just heard this new pastor came, blah, 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 blah from Dallas. And back then, Dallas, when they tell it was four years, and you came out of there, you were reading this in the Hebrew Bible, all right? They really focused on the biblical languages. This dear Pat, humble, humble, humble man, came in there, and he knew all of us. We were, pray you, you know us? Yeah, I know you play this, and you did, Bible. we just went, oh, wow. He got up there, graciously, mercifully, he preached out of 1 John 3, 1 through 10. Ladies and gentlemen, God through him set us and he pointed the fact, or he didn't, but God through him pointed out the fact that no, it means once you've come to Christ, you have, you have come against that thing. I don't need you. I can do it on my own. He says now you have become a believer. You don't continue in that same lifestyle of rejecting Christ, thinking you're your own God, but now you're following him and your sins are covered under his blood and you're walking in his righteousness. And the only reason you're doing that is not because you're so great, hallelujah, I emphasize this, but it's because Jesus in you is great and you cannot continue to do it. That just set us free. Anyway, the point being, you find false direction all over the place, even under the Christian rubric. Okay? That's what I'm trying to say to you. So we have to go back to the Word of God. This has got, you'd be thankful you've got a pastor like this young man and, and Pastor Reuben. I just want to tell you all, and know that their assistance. Okay, let's look at the biblical view down here. I'm sorry, by ignorance. I left off the part up here. Uh, let's look up here at the Hadith Sahih Bukhari. Okay? The Hadith is like uh, your early church fathers that wrote all their writings. That's kind of what the hadith is. It's stories about the prophet and what he did. He did this, he did that, and so forth and so on, okay? Uh, let's see. Okay, here it is. Narrated Abu Sa'id al Khurdri. Once Allah's apostle went out to uh, the Musala, that is, to offer prayer. O Idal Adaha al Fatah, prayer. That means, O oh, Allah, you're so great, and this, that, and the other. Then he passed by the women and said, O women, give alms as I have seen that the majority of the dwellers of hellfire were you. They asked, Why is it so, O Allah's apostle? He replied, You curse frequently and ungrateful to your husbands. I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence and religion than you. How, do you, how well do you... 
I would love some of these leftists in our country today think Islam's the best thing since sliced bread. How would you like it if they got up and read what Allah, I mean, what, what Muhammad said about the women? I mean, the ignorance in our country is enormous. It really is. It's sad. I don't mean people are just, they don't read. They don't know. They don't, they just follow along with whatever the mass says here, okay? All right. A cautious, sensible man could be led astray by some of you, the women ask. Oh, Allah's apostle, what is deficient in our intelligence and religion? He said, is not the evidence of two women equal to the witness of one man? They replied in the affirmative. He said, this is the deficiency of her intelligence. Isn't it true that a woman can neither pray nor fast during her menses? That is a menstrual cycle. The woman replied in the affirmative. He said, this is the, defense, the deficiency in her religion. And then down here, narrated Imran bin Hussein. The prophet said, I looked at paradise and found poor people forming the majority of its inhabitants. And I looked at hell and I saw the majority of its inhabitants were women. <laughs> this is pretty revealing, isn't it? Again, let me encourage you all to get that book, The Meaning of the Holy Quran by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Get it. You can get these copies of the, of the Deef. Actually, you can go online, and they have all this stuff now online. But this is important. The biblical view. Ooh. <laughs> Wives. Now, the word be subject is not in the Greek. It just means to your husbands as to the Lord. Mean. As you submit to the Lord, you need to submit to your husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. How is Christ head of the church? Is he a dictator? Is he a tyrant? No. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives to their husbands and everything. Ooh. Guys, this next verse here by itself is a mouthful. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. We first got married, I came out of an athletic background that's been my whole life. I consider my wife to be a fellow teammate. Actually, he was the coach and I was the player. Yeah. <laughs> that's the truth. Yeah, that's kind of the truth. That's, that's kind of the truth, mother. Yes, that's the truth. <laughs> but I was also the player along with being the coach. I know. The point being, let me just say, here's what God did. As I saw my own sin, and God said, Justin, how have I forgiven you? I said, Lord, for everything. He said, therefore, you love your wife in the same way. That was huge. In other words, as he has loved me, and that's how I'm supposed to love her. I'm going to tell you what. That's very painful, guys, because of our own prideful narcissism. Are you with me? Our own self-love. being It's uncomfortable, very uncomfortable at times, to love my wife when she does things that really irritate me greatly. I used to, blah, 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 but I bless her. It's been a process because I've learned to do the other. Come on in, Miss Cindy, they're right up here. Because as I've done the other, I've learned what a failure I've been, and it's all about me. And, and, I, and I, the Holy Spirit will say, what if God did to you, Justin, as you're doing to your wife? Then he goes on and says the rest of the stuff. It's, it's huge there, but that right there is itself. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle. So husbands, love your wives as your own bodies. He who loves his wife will love himself. Powerful statement, isn't it? This is the absolute unequivocal antithesis of what Islam teaches about the husband-wife relationship. The antithesis, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Islamic view. Both below is the Islamic view of marriage. All right, here we go. Y'all ready? A Muslim man may be married up to four wives collectively at a time, but he is required to treat and provide for them equally. Okay? I'm not going to read that thing. You can read it. A Muslim man was allowed to have concubines who were actually women taken as the spoils of war and they became their slaves with whom they could have sexual relations, but these women did not have the same rights as their wives. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't really see that going on today so much, but in certain places it is. However, the Quran fully absolves the man from any wrongdoing 
if he chooses to have sex with his slave girl, and he ha may have as many as he wishes. And there you have the references. However, only in some Islamic African countries is slave concubine is still practiced today. Like in your, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, it's not, but some of the African countries it still is. One of the most interesting aspects about Islamic marriage practice is what's called, this is very interesting, Nechamuta, Nechamuta, which in simple terms means temporary marriage. As in Hebrew, so too in Arabic and all Semitic languages, all nouns come from a verb form. Thus, the word for to marry is Nahama, okay? From which the noun Naham is derived, okay? However, that little word there is a funny, that's just a symbol for an Arabic letter. However, it is the next word that is most intriguing, which is the word muta. And it means enjoyment, pleasure, delight, gratification, compensation paid to a divorced woman, temporary marriage, usufruct, the right of using and enjoying all the advantages and profits of the property of another without altering or damaging the substance. Uh, marriage contracted for a specific time and exclusively for the purpose of sexual pleasure. This is not something I made up. This is in an Arabic dictionary. This, uh, so that's why I wanted to write this down and substantiate this for you. It comes from the Arabic verb mata, which means to make someone enjoy something, to give as compensation to a divorce warming something, to gratify the eye and to make someone enjoy something, to have the usufruct uh, is the usage of something. Uh, and enjoy, savor, and relish something. However, the Sunni on the whole reject this form of temporary marriage, but the Shia accept it as valid. Shia, this, that's, that's where the Iranians are, by the way. In fact, in Surah 424, we see the verb mata being used to describe this very situation of a woman without a husband. Also prohibited are women already married, except those whom your right hands possess, Thus hath God ordained prohibitions against you, except for these. All others are lawful, provided you seek them in marriage with gifts from your property, desiring chastity, not lust. Seek that you derive benefit, is to ma'atum, from them, okay, excuse me, seeing that you derive benefit from them, Give them their dowers at least as prescribed. But if after a dower is prescribed, you agree mutually to vary it, there is no blame on you, and God is all knowing and all wise. Now, what in the world is that saying? That's saying that if you see some woman and you desire, you can have a what's called a pleasure marriage. You can say, I want to marry you, you marry them, you marry for two weeks, then you divorce them. Now we say that is crazy. That's like sanctified prostitution, isn't it? exactly what it is, all right? What is also interesting about Nechab uh, is that it doesn't count toward the maximum of four wives at any given time for the marriage. Thus, a man can Nechab as often as he wishes, with as many women as he wishes, and he is still living within the framework of good Islamic marital regulations. Years ago, we were back in Virginia, and I was teaching a course on this Islam thing, and there was a guy there who was an engineer. And we had a break, and he said, I have seen this with my own eyes. I said, well, how? He was an engineer, and they went to, Bac is it Dubai or Bahrain? I forget now where it was. Anyway, one of those Muslim countries, and for they were, they were engineers, they were doing oil exploration. He and two other Muslim guys. He said these two Muslim guys called ahead of time and arranged for this temporary marriage. So they each had these two women there separately for two weeks while they were there. Then when they left, they divorced them. So basically, they got married and they got divorced. So it was it's what you call a legitimized form of prostitution. It's very tragic. And I just told you about that. All right. 
Women are considered to be uh, rebellious toward their husbands. Women who are considered to be rebellious toward their husbands may be physically struck and slapped by their husbands, according to the Quran. You can read that yourself. We're not going to go over it, but it, it's incredible. Oh, let me read it because it's good here. Men are the protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has given the one more strength than the other and because they support them from their means. Therefore, the righteous women are devoutly obedient and guard in the husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. As to those women on whose part you fear disloyalty and ill conduct, admonish them first, next, refuse to share their beds, and last, beat them. But if they return to obedience, seek not against them means that is of annoyance, for all is most high. So basically, ladies, your husband has the right to just beat the snot out of you if he feels led to. Quite a contrast in 1 Peter 3.15, isn't it? Husband, love your wives as the weaker vessel, considering them a joint heir with you with Christ. The contrast is enormous. The Quran allows for men to divorce their wives, but the Quran does not allow women to divorce their husbands. However, there are some Muslim countries that do allow women to pursue divorce. All right. Muhammad had up to nine wives at one point. But he was able to because of the revelations he received that permitted him to do so. O prophet, we've made lawful to thee thy wives to whom thou hast paid their dowers and those whom Thy right hand possesses out of the prisoners of war whom God has assigned to thee, and daughters of thy paternal uncles and aunts, and daughters of thy material, excuse me, maternal uh, uncles and aunts, who migrated from Mecca with thee. And any believing woman who dedicates her soul to the prophet, if the prophet wishes to wed her. <coughs> this, 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 only for you, only for you is this, and not for the believers at large. Oh, interesting, huh? It's kind of like, does this sound like somebody that y'all heard of? Like, who was the guy that started Mormonism? John Smith. Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith. Does this sound like him? And the revelations, he absolutely unequivocally. <laughs> we know that we have appointed for them as to their wives and captives from their right hands possessed in order there should be no difficulty for thee, and God is all forgiving, most merciful. Who was also the other big Mormon leader in Utah that a university is named after? He had about 12 wives. Wow. The point I'm making, ladies and gentlemen, is that the same lie out of Islam, when you read Mormon, is almost identical in many ways. Different, the difference is there, but the same thing. Okay? All right. Uh, Anas bin Malik said the prophet used to visit all his wives around during the day at night and there were 11 in number. I asked Anas, had the prophet the strength for it? Anas replied, we used to say the prophet was given the strength of 30 men. And Sa'id said an authority of Qadar that Anas told him about nine wives only, not 11. Anyway, he had 12. Okay. Uh, I mean, excuse me, he had nine wives. Uh, the, the point being is that as we read this, uh, and it says he had 11, and that may very well have been the case. We don't know. But whatever, he, however many he had, this was his thing. But he had special permission for this from Allah, supposedly. All right. Or from his view of what he thought God said. In addition to the above practice of Muhammad, with regard to the number of wives he had, as we already discussed the concept of concubines, we have another bit of insight with regard to Muhammad's view concerning concubines. Narrated by Ibn Buharitz, I entered the mosque and saw Abu Sa'id al-Khurdi and sat beside him and, he, and asked him about al-Azil, that is a coitus interruptus. In, anyway, that's what it means. Abu Sa'id said, we went out with Allah's apostle for the Ghazwa of Bana al-Mustalih and we received captives from among the Arab captives and we desired women and celibacy became hard on us and we loved to do coitus interruptus. So when we intended to do coitus interruptus, we said, how can we do coitus interruptus before asking Allah's apostle who is present among us? We asked him about it, and he said, it is better for you not to do so, for if any soul till the day of resurrection is predestined exists, it will exist. The coitus interruptus is the act of non-consummation in sexual intercourse. 
I don't have to explain to you what that means. The kids are gone. Good. So you know what that means, okay? So thus, according to the Hadith, Muhammad gave full approval of this man to have and use the concubines they acquired through military conquest or other means. So basically, you can do with them whatever you want to. So outside of Christianity, we see unequivocally how the Muslims treat their women. And this is a reality. I spoke to one one time uh, outside of EOS. Saw his wife there, and he came in there dressed to work out. He had a short sleeve shirt, shorts on us. His wife had the thing down here on the head. Pants. I said, and I just said, hey, I said, so you really came to work out, didn't you, ma'am? She said, pardon? You know that? I said, you came here to really sweat. I said, your husband, he's just a wimp. He's taking the easy way out. He only has shorts and a shirt. And the guy just looked at me and just kind of went, huh? <laughs> but it's really a joke. Because they think their hair, I mean, that's not, not trying to be crude, but that makes no difference. But in their mind, the, that legalism, that indicates that they're absolutely under the control and domination of that man. But it's a joke. The, 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 uh, it's a, anyway, move on. Secular humanism. In the arena of sociology, the secular humanist hereto denies all forms of supernaturalism as being both mythical and part of mankind's super, super, superstitious background. Their aim, therefore, is to help society to grow and develop into its full humanistic capacities that are revealed and open up through the means of the natural sciences and the scientific method. However, there's also another important aspect of their approach to the social sciences, and that is the infusion of political activism of all types to help attain and achieve their stated goals of a better society. I tell you as believers, God's called us to be involved. He's called us to stand for truth, not to just to roll over and play dead. Oh, it's not spirit. That's a, that is absolutely a farce. That is a pseudo form of spirituality and you're lying to yourself because you're afraid to go out and stand for the truth. I'm not here judging anybody, but I'm saying I, for me not to say that, I would be lying. It's not, I mean, listen, being threatened by Klansmen is no fun. But there was no way I could sit there and abide by that and basically have the attitude toward blacks that they did. Okay? So, the following, therefore, just some aspects of secular humanist sociology. Number one, human beings are innately good. But the evil that exists in the world around us has been caused by society as a whole and the social structures that have emerged over the millennia. Thus, the aim of secular humanistic sociology is to restructure the various societal forms of our lives from family, education, etc., etc., and remove the restrictions that inhabit the development of the innate goodness of man to flourish and enrich our lives socially. Is that incredible or what? So the church is part of that removal because we are prohibiting man from his innate goodness by calling, saying, you're a sinner. Sin is destroying it. They don't want to hear that. Two, the traditional family is seen as a leading contributor to the demise of society in every way because of its narrowly defined roles of men and women, and especially the way women are viewed in a subordinate way as being the producer and caretaker of children in the home. And as a result of that view, the woman has not been able to reach the maximum of her potential socially in the competitive economic market with her innate talents and abilities. This is from their perspective. I see women all the time that, that growing up as I did, my mama was for one. Thus, many in the secular humanistic community suggest alternatives to the traditional family that sound identical in many ways to the Marxist view of open and extended marriages. That is, multiple partners without any long-lasting marital commitments, cooperatives and collective communes for child-rearing and beginning education of children. In addition to these changes, there is the full inclusion of alternate, alternative family lifestyles such as homosexual, bisexual couples who either have children naturally or adopt them, but then the rearing of those children would be in a public commune as described above. God's given an order by the husband, it's the head, the wife, and the children. Husband, you're the one there to, you're the main servant of your wife and children. So when we see these things of women trying to go out of that thing, for example, it's a martial arts thing. We have a young lady there that's a second degree black belt. 
when she was testing for her first black, there's no way I'm going to fight a woman like I would a man. It's just, I will never, it just won't happen. So I was trying to help her do something and get her thing, and I, somebody said, Justin, I looked over there, and she knocked a snot out of me. She kicked me right now, cut my eye, I had to go to the doctor and get stitches up. It was always, always tell, tease her about that. But here's the reality. She's a sweet, precious young lady. She has a husband, a dear man. They love the Lord, they precious children. But the reality is, CJ, would you ever fight her as you would a man? Never. It's just, we're not going to do it. It's just crazy. So this whole idea of trying to say that women and men are the same, that's just ludicrous, okay? Ladies, you are the weaker. Not the inferior, but the weaker. I see women over there working out. Some of them are doing pretty good stuff. But there's no woman over there that can even remotely come close to a guy her age. It just doesn't happen. So what this is trying to do here is do away with any kind of sex. Like we now, you can't call people he or she. I don't know to call them it. I call them he and she. That's not going to change with me. But in some places, you can't even do that. So we see this kind of perversion. Are you with me? Amen. It's permeating everything. Okay. With regard to the education of the children, the secular humanists see the classroom as the foundation of the dissemination of secular humanistic sociological concepts, just like you were saying, ma'am. And they encourage, and like you were saying too, uh, Nathan, and they're encouraging teachers in all subjects to purvey this message. One of the most uh, fascinating aspects of secular humanistic sociology is the focus on discovering the greatest needs of man individually and socially. When I read their aim and I see their conclusion, it is indeed above their own self-deification. Excuse me, it is about their own self-deification, which they call self-actualization. That is, coming to the point where we as human beings, in essence, realize that we are our own God and can make up our, the rules for our lives as to what we determine as good and evil for us individually, and this is all in order that we as human beings may reach our full potential. So we see the distortion between the realization of men and women that we are different, we're not the same. That God's given men roles, God's given women's roles. But we're, as men, we're supposed to be servant, not rule over them like they're a dog, okay, or a piece of property. And we grow in that. That's what God said. We're to love wives, love your husbands as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. But we have distinct roles. The women bear the children. We provide for the families. The women works. I mean, my mother worked. And, and my wife, is, does, as I say, I'm known as Janie Alfred's husband. She speaks all over the place, teaches. But we have different roles, different capacities that God's called us into. All right. For the economic perspective, from the secular humanistic society of socialistic and Marxist in its approach, as was stated in point number one, secular humanistic sociology stresses the point that mankind is basically good, but it is the structures of society that have brought evil in the world, and this is especially true in the economic field. Thus, for the secular humanist sociologist, capitalism is a result of the Judeo-Christian influence, Western culture. It needs to be replaced with a Marxist socialist approach where the individual may reach his own individualized economic potential without being used as an instrument for someone else's personal gain enrichment in the capitalistic system of the employer, employee economic framework in which the employer is enriched by the employee's work. That's, that's what that young woman that just won the Democratic nomination in New York. She doesn't know beans from doodly squat about anything outside of her little thing. They were asked, she was asked about the Middle East. She didn't know what to say. She said, well, I'm not so, but what, is she, what is the term she said? Anyway, I don't know what's going on. This is what she said. Well, it, capitalism, I don't want, so I'm looking at her and I'm listening to what she's saying. This always goes back to this whole thing of victimization. It isn't fair that somebody makes more than I make. It isn't fair this, that, and the other. The point is that in our country, people have had the opportunity. You work hard, you go to school, you do all these things. Uh, I think today, and this is true, I, I, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Vocational training is really important. There are people who are skilled in mechanics and such that don't want to be physicists or something of that nature. We all have different areas. Uh, there are those who God has blessed financially, a lot, others of us, 
You know, but to live in jealousy and resentment, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you, that is the apex of self-destruction. It really is. And I thank God personally that my mama was an example, working three jobs, and I worked five at one point. But to live in that kind of jealousy and that kind of the world owes me a living, tra tra uh, tragically, that's what our welfare system has produced. That's what it has produced. And we need to move out of that. All right, let's move on from here. Point number six over here. Social activism is the means by which secular humanist sociologists seeks to influence these changes. That whole quote is about that, okay? Let me just read part of it. Humanists also seek to use the institution of the state, especially the judiciary, to establish their agenda, including such non-traditional ideas as establishing state-run child care centers following a narrow interpretation of separation of church, meaning the Christian church and state, and passing legislation for gay rights, same-sex marriage, abortion on demand, and animal rights. Let me just tell you this. You know, one of the reasons you see this opposition to Brett Kavanaugh as the Supreme Court Justice, the lies, the deceit, the stuff that they're perpetrating, you see in the Democrats and the Senate and others and elsewhere, is because this man is a Christian, but he stands for the Constitution versus is a, is a jurist, he's just there to interpret the Constitution, not make laws, which is what the four liberals on there, that's exactly what they see it as. I never will forget when Al Gore made the comment, the Constitution is a breathing thing. That's like saying the Bible is a breathing thing. Now we can come and we can make amendments. Okay, but you, Bible, you can't make any amendments, all right? But what we do want to do is understand what it's saying. But when you, re when you see that, you realize that there are jurists today, especially in the liberal, tragically the democratic set, who they see themselves there as making laws, not interpreting the law. And this is exactly what they're looking for. This is what we're seeing with our own eyes today. That's what we see in New York with that young woman. Okay, the marxist leninist approach to sociology is not much different from the secular humanist approach. The primary difference between the two, however, would be the infusion of dialectical materialism as a foundational principle of societal evolution in the Marxist-Leninist sociological belief system. That is, that according to the Darwinian evolutionary model, as well as the uh, eviscerated application of Hegel's dialectic thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, Marxist-Leninist sociology is a belief in a scientific model of societal development that will eventually result in a utopian society that will be the ultimate continuous state of humanity's existence. Just like in the Soviet Union. I don't hear any reaction. Where is the Soviet Union today? They're gone. Oh! I thought they were going to go into eternity like that. No. Obviously not. So, what we're dealing with here, and this is absolutely essential, is that all of these groups are looking with man is going to make his own society without any external laws. We have no limitations on ourselves. Back on page, I guess I'm on page 80 now. I don't know where y'all are. Anyway, it's a paragraph. <laughs> Thus, according to the Marxist-Leninist sociology, external economic factors determine a society totally apart from the actions of individuals, moved by moral implications and values that may govern their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, that is huge to keep in mind. So what we're talking about, a spiritual battle, it may turn into a physical battle. I, I trust that it won't, but it may. But I'm just here to tell you that there are people that want to do away with the church. They want to do away with the Bible. They want to do away with Christianity. They want to deny it. The uh, Antifa group is one of them. And so what I'm saying to you and me, we have to stand for the truth. We have to speak the truth. Now, I want to be real careful when I say this, but you know, people talk about force and all this, and I've heard, I've been around folks who say, well, I don't believe in using violence, so I don't believe in using force. I just want to trust God, really. And so I say, well, why do you still live in this country then? because you're able to do what we're doing right now, why are we able to do this right now today? Anybody? What? 
Well, yes, but I mean, right now, today, why are we, August 25th, 2018, able to sit here and discuss this? Because we've had our military fight and kill the people that want to come and kill us. We've got policemen out there that are armed. And I thank God that we can be armed. Okay? Many years ago, 31 years ago, I was jumped outside of our church in Colorado Springs. I knew some basic martial arts stuff, and I was a big guy. I knew how to, you know, street fighting and stuff. I mean, just growing up in the South. But I was jumped by about 15 guys. If I had not known how to defend myself, my wife screamed at one point. This guy was coming with a board, had a nail in it right on top of my head. If she hadn't screamed and hit me, I wouldn't be here. I'd have been dead. I turned. I blocked it. Guided from it. And I felt like I was Samson with the jawbone of the ass fighting those guys. Main way, long story short. That happened. My wife and children were in the car watching the whole thing. The point I'm making, ladies and gentlemen, I pray to God that you never have to do that. But you may. And as a result of that, we witnessed to those kids. We had a bunch of kids that came to Christ through that. But the point being, this is reality. And we need to be aware of what we're dealing with and what we're, what we're being confronted with. So the Marxist-Leninist position is that they want to crush us. They want to do away with us. They want to destroy us. They don't want anything to do with biblical truth in any way, shape, form, or, f or fashion, okay? Now, their view that this communist society will reach that point, look down here at the bottom, I'm on 80, I don't know where y'all are. It says, this perspective, it's a new paragraph, right after that big quote. This perspective is unequivocally based on the premise that man is basically good, not evil, and therefore man can, on his own, without the assistance of any supposed divine assistance, achieve this utopian society. And this is because of the internal dialectic working in and through society, which in turn is based on the above stated premise, man is basically good. What is the first thing that Jesus says the Holy Spirit convicts us of before we come to Christ? Sin which implies that we are not what? Good. We are what? So you can see from very simple two and two kind of thing, this is where we are opposed. This is where the opposition is, all right? Area of education, Marxist, Leninist sociality, identical to secular humanists. They want to get in there, affect the children from primary all the way up. They want to tr do away with Christian influence in every way they possibly can. This is what we see happening. In the area of the family, Marxist, Leninist sociology is intrinsically linked to the secular humanistic ultimate view of family. In fact, it was from the Marxist, Leninist concepts that the humanist view of family life and sexual license have emerged in large part, although, although these have in there, not that it was a beginning form, uh, began to be elucidating what the culture doing and since the enlightenment of the 18th century. So basically, again, we see this. The following is taken from Frederick. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to be part of it. Book, The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. It's a, it is an important revelation to the heart of Marxist sinless sociology, which I might add is at the heart of every godless, self-deified approach to life, and that it is and that it has no limits. It has no limits. Ah. Uh, Sorry about that. Has no limits to sexual fulfillment and promiscuity, but rather lifting up such so-called freedom as the apex of one reaching his or her full human potential. And as I said, I'm not going to read all that. You can read that. When I started studying that stuff at UCLA, I was amazed. I couldn't believe it. Because everything I read, I wasn't just reading, but I was reading the actual text in these ancient languages. And I'm reading that stuff. I said, good night alive. This is what Leviticus 18 was all about. Talking about that. <coughs> well, we've covered that pretty well. Let's go now over here to cosmic humanism. The cosmic humanist sociology is the most esoteric of all. That means the most woo. Okay. I tell you what let's do. Let's take a teeny little let me just see here. 
Let's take a teeny little break here for five minutes. Let me drink some water and just rest. We'll hit this. We'll have Q&A, then we'll have the conclusion, and we'll be done. Cosmic humanism. The cosmic humanist sociology is the most esoteric of all. I said that, and that is based upon reaching this ultimate self-deification, which time we will be united with the one mind of God, meaning that we all have realized our deified state. This is basically it, okay? And uh, this is the most deceptive of all because it thinks we are on God. We we're so great. We're so wonderful. Okay. You make up stuff as you go. Your mind, the deception is enormous. Down at the bottom, with regard to the family, cosmic humanists also see the traditional family of a father, mother, children as being an outdated institution and, that, and one that needs, uh, one that needs to be set aside for more uh, fulfilling relationships <laughs> that aid us in realizing and reaching our godhood. Can you believe that? Do away with it. It's all about me. Going down, well, you can read those quotes yourself, but let's go down to my next little thing there. Education with the cosmic humanist is also a paramount concern. Top of 84. Top of 84. And what is quite interesting is that, according to Ferguson, Marilyn Ferguson, a leader of the Cosmic Humanists, of all the New Age professionals who surveyed the Aquarian conspiracy, more were involved in education than in any other single category of work. Ooh. Thus, from the Cosmic Humanism, uh, <laughs> thus from the Cosmic Humanism sociological perspective. By teaching children the proper attitudes toward themselves and their consciousnesses, New Age educators believe they can create a generation capable of ushering in the New Age. So ladies and gentlemen, God is equipping us to be prepared to do this battle. And let me tell you, you're never going to quit being prepared. You're never going to quit learning. It's not going to stop until we breathe our last breath. Postmodernism. Well, let me through this, this, this summation. Therefore, cosmic humanist, so, humanistic sociology views our current institutions of marriage, family, church, education, government as entities that are hindering our development into the fullness of our individual Godhead and self-deification. Thus, according to cosmic humanists, social, societal institutions must refrain from inhibiting our inhibital. God, I'm so tired. Must refrain from inhibiting our individual evolution to higher consciousness. So, we're looking at everything outside of a biblical Christianity is almost identical. It's amazing. Postmodernism. The postmodern sociology also regulates our current traditional institutions of family, education, church, <coughs> economics, education, and government as part of our culture that defines and determines who we are versus us as individuals defining and, and determining who we are outside of these boundaries. And this is especially true regarding the organized church. The following is a very clear view of how postmodernists view the organized church as well as any believers who speak out from a biblical perspective on current issues that impact our nation. And this is especially true, golly. And this is especially true of any elected officials or of individual committed believers who want to run for office. Now, this is important. Let's read this. In the future of religion, Rorty replaces his atheism with anti-clericalism. Wow. Contending that congregations of the faithful are socially unobjectionable, but ecclesiastical institutions are dangerous to the health of democratic societies. 
So basically, if you just a, if you're just a clergyman, and you want to preach in with a little church, no problem. Just keep your mouth shut about things outside of that. To Rorty, religion is unob is unobjectionable as long as it is privatized. In other words, private religious views are acceptable, but the organized church is not. Why? Because you don't care what you believe, just so you don't start trying to make an influence around in the in your community in your society. Thus, postmodernists do not want committed believers to express their views from a biblical, moral perspective on any issues that affect the political direction of our country. A form of political tyranny and a clear denial of the First Amendment. Do you understand what we're talking about? This is where we are, ladies and gentlemen. Muslims, on the other hand, may do so because they appear at this time to be in the vast minority. But believers in Jesus have a great influence on radical godless legislation, legislation that is heading our country in a self-destructive direction, and the postmodernists want us to keep quiet. They're blind, the ignorance and blindness of these people with regard to Islam, what we just got through reading. The, the feminine, I mean, they're, they're, they don't, all they look at, they look at, is, they, they look at my enemy is my friend when you're against my enemy. You know, it's kind of like we were in World War II. Russia, we joined with Russia, ally against uh, Germany. But obviously they were totally opposite of where we were as far as their belief factors. But we were against the Nazis. So today, they see the Muslims against Christians. They're against Christians. You're my friend. But they don't realize how much the Muslims hate them as well. Isn't that amazing? With regard to marriage, the family, and our sexual lives, postmodern sociology is the complete antithesis of the biblical view in all these areas. Let's just look at some of this. Many postmodern socialists consider marriage the greatest of evils. Highlight that if you have a yellow marker. Other postmodernists show their contempt for Christian concepts of li of life of life must be of Wait a minute, how do you do that? What in the world? Were, uh, Concepts of life. Li oh, gosh. Life. <clears throat> Writing my own stuff is not bad, but it's when you quote people and you have to type it out there, it's my ignorance. Other postmodernists show their con contempt for Christian concept of life, sex, and marriage, preferring various forms of free love, hooking up, shacking up, living together, cohabitation. Postmodernist uh, psychiatrist Adam Phillips precludes the possibility of contractual marriage and describes any relationship in harsh terms. The only... Uh, safe. Safe. Golly. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. The only safe foregone conclusion about any relationship is that it is an experiment. And that exactly what it is an experiment in will never be clear to the participants. For the same so-called relationships could never be subject to contract. What this is saying is that marriage is only about you feeling good. If you don't like it, you get out. Don't commit to it. Do what, Mother? Don't commit to it. Don't commit to it, yeah. And so we see, that's why we see children. I mean, look, and I'm not here, this is not a racial comment, it's a fact. 70%, tragically, in African-American families today, 70% of the children born are born out of wedlock. I don't know what the thing is white, but they're, too, they're white, I mean, it's everywhere, but I just know that because I read that recently. Because of the lack of biblical, at one time, phew, when I grew up in the civil rights days and the NAACP was head by, headed by godly people, not so today. But we're talking about total chaos uh, in the family relationship and in the black community, that's absolutely the case. Acknowledging the traditional heterosexual family as the norm in Western society, postmodernists decry that this heterosexist norm enables society uh, Enable society should be too marginalized. Golly, I had a hard time with this. 
to marginalize some sexual practices as against nature and thereby attempt to prove the naturalness of a heterosexual monogamy and family values upon which mainstream society bases itself. So what you see here is an absolute unequivocal opposition to the Bible in every aspect of life. Are you with me? Amen. They hate us. They hate the Bible. They're going to do everything. That's why we, not just quoting the scripture, we've got to study it, we've got to know it, not just headwise, but in our hearts, and we have got to be men and women of prayer. Are you all with me? Yes. This is absolutely essential here. In education, in the education sector, postmodern sociology has a very radical agenda in, what, in that it wants to dispel any notions of absolute truth in any venue and in turn teach students that they are their own source of truth. Nathan, if you, I think, where's the microphone? Where, Rick, oh, the, could you give that to Nathan? I want him to address what you were just talking about earlier about critical thinking. Yes, right there. This is absolutely essential. In other words, we were talking about critical thinking and the fact that students today just hit the surface without going to the source of the truth and how important that is for us. Go ahead. It uh, essentially is endemic in our society with social media, with surface level thought. Uh, a picture and a phrase is truth, no depth, no reasoning of true <sighs> understanding foundational. And let me just say this, that's not only just today, that's always been the case. Are you with me? So you see revival, you see growth, and then you see this, this exact same thing throughout history. You go back and you read history, you see this. It is a continuous thing. You read the Old Testament, that's what they dealt with continuously. The people forgot about God's word. They went after the other gods. They did all this kind of stuff. You read the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was written just before what happened. Nebuchadnezzar comes in and basically destroys Jerusalem, 586. And he ends up going down to Egypt, Jeremiah does. But here's the reality. We today are facing a battle that is absolutely incredible. Now, the following demonstrates this agenda in terms that we can see today. And those of us who live in California, we are seeing it before our very eyes. Uh, Look there at the second little quote there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's re read the other thing. Anderson outlines major shifts in focus in the postmodern classroom in contrast to the modern classroom. Here we go. Education should emphasize works not in the canon. It should focus on the achievements of non-whites, females, and the poor. It should highlight the historical crimes of whites, males, and the rich. And it should teach children that science's method has no better claim to yielding truth than any other method, and, and accordingly, that students should be equally receptive to alternative ways of knowing. As I say, as a young man in the South growing up, seeing the racism in the Klan. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a racism today with the blacks, you see, with the La Raza, with the Hispanic. All this anti-white stuff, uh, the, uh, what's the other word, I'm, the other, uh, uh, Oh, the males that we as males, what is that, what do they call that thing now? Uh, with men. We were watching this the other night. They had, remember when Tucker had this woman? No, no, Jesse Waters did, had that woman on there teaching at some university saying that men are all wrong, that, that uh, uh, oh, what was the word? I don't even, I'm so tired, I can't even remember now. But anyway, he was talking about the fact that men are the, we are the, reason that society is as bad as it is. And women need to be all this, uh, all these various and certain things. So in other words, what we're talking about here is without any uh, uh, hesitation, a discriminatory uh, sexism, but it's gone the other way. It's, it's toward uh, other areas and blaming whites, males, and rich. So you see all of this stuff going on. Uh, it's, it's very, very fascinating. All right. Uh, Look down here at courses. Courses, course offerings at colleges and universities in the postmodern age are also non-traditional, focusing on themes of race, sex, and gender. It's gender inequality. We see that all the time. Uh, standard, Stanford University's Feminist Studies Department, lesbian communities and identities. 
uh, the history. Homosexuals, heretics, witches, werewolves. <laughs> now this is asinine to say that as being complimentary. Can you believe that in major universities they're teaching something like this? But ladies and gentlemen, when you leave God out and you lose your mind, you really do, you lose your mind as far as common sense and order and truth, you start living in a hallucinatory world with all kinds of, of illusory type of uh, concepts and ideas. Uh, this, is, this is absolutely a reality and one that we need to keep in mind. How many of y'all ever read anything about Anselm? He was a Catholic priest, but he was an incredible thinker. He basically was a precursor to the Reformation in many ways. And what happened in the Catholic Church is that even the popes, they didn't know the Bible, and the perversion was enormous, the, cru the, the, the ignorance, I mean, just the concepts and ideas. So what we're seeing here is you go back and study history, you see cycles like this. <laughs> And you see that when revival takes place and people are uh, come to Christ and they start reading and studying all types of the, the natural blending that God wants in our lives, spiritually, mentally, and physically, occurs. When you don't have that, you get utter disorder and utter chaos, all right? Uh, not only has the subject matter of courses and departments shifted dramatically away from traditional fair, Christianity is often viewed with contempt and ridicule. Richard Brody, Professor of Comparative Literature at Stanford writes, when we American college teachers encounter religious fundamentalists, we do our best to convince these students of the benefits of secularization. I think, think students are lucky to find themselves under people like me and to have escaped the grip of their frightening, vicious, dangerous parents. God's not that so, this is what we're dealing with. And we need to continue to pray, not only just for revival, spiritually, that's got to be the foundational thing, but as that, for Christians to grow up really learning truth. Are you with me? Yes. Not, what's that fake workout stuff? I see it on TV all the time. What? Bowflex, thank you. Not Bowflex training, spiritually, mentally, or physically, but the real training, spiritually, mentally. It's going to be hard. It's going to be demanding. But God's called us to grow and learn. Are you with me? Yes. All right. Due to the seriousness of the last example I quoted concerning Rorty, uh, excuse me, a Zeller at Bowling Green University. Uh, let me just—I forgot to read this. My ignorance. Uh, not all new courses are met with enthusiasm. Richard Zeller, a soci sociology professor at Bowling Green State University in Ohio, attempted to introduce a new course that would examine the effects of political correctness in response to students' claim that they felt pressured to assume politically correct views in order to pass courses. What a great course! But look what happened. BGSU's Director of Women's Studies, Kathleen Dixon, protested vehemently, saying, we forbid any course that says we restrict free speech. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can't handle criticism or critique, get out. We're seeing some of the most educated but imbecilic, weak-minded, pathetic, cool Justin. <laughs> Tragically misdirected individuals. Amen. And our institutes of higher learning, they cannot handle any criticism. It is a tyrannical, despotic role. God's called us, I, I, but listen, I've seen this both in, in church things too. I'm a member of Calvary Chapel, but I've seen some groups that have come in and don't want any questions or anything about what they say or do. That's not, the, that's not what it's about. It's not about any one man. Never was about, I've seen people who take what Chuck has written and they've tried to build that thing up to where that's the grid for truth. It's not. Okay, God's word is. That's what he came out of the four square for. So you see that, but here's what I'm thinking. Developing critical thinking, not being a critical, but I mean going to the truth, the source, that is absolutely essential. All right, let me get back here. The course was voted down and Zeller resigned in protest after 25 years of teaching at Bowling Green. 
Due to the seriousness of the last example I quoted concerning Professor Richard Zeller at Bowling Green, because what's happening at these universities, they're not in, in interested in really educating children. They're not interested in training them. They're not interested in developing them. They're interested in basically molding these kids into coming out and saying, so, I'm just saying to all of us, the battle is on. It's going to get tough. Okay? It's going to get tough. You, you need to be prepared for what you're going to face, all right? I want to present in this paper most of the article about him. There it is. But I'm not going to read that whole thing. You can read it yourself, okay? That's for your benefit there, okay? Go back and read it. Thus, what we see in the above is a mirror of what is happening across our country in secondary education, college, universities, the national media, of newspapers, television, and sadly to say, in the current, well, you can tell when I started writing this, can't you? In the current Obama administration, I need to change that, put, put it this way, in the former. <laughs> As well, both before and after he was elected president, is an overt attempt to shut down the opposition and not allow anything said that is contrary to the current politically correct language for whatever venue is being discussed. The AP, I, I see all these people attack Trump. Trump's got his issues. He needs to be addressed. But to, oh, was Obama. Obama was a liar to the core of his being. The apex of hypocrisy in the above article concerns the response to Zeller's proposal to teach a course exposing the bias and unsubstantiated claims and assertions of certain courses by the women heading up the women's studies. Pro They're not concerned about truth. They have an agenda. That's what they want to do. We forbid any course that says we restrict, restrict free speech. They can't handle criticism. That's what we see in the left today. The tragedy is that this woman cannot see her own tyrannical and oppressive attitude toward that which she doesn't want to be said that would disagree with her position, and that is the very thing that she is asserting that others have done to her. I want to say this. As a Southern Baptist, I was blessed to be at the seminary where I went because the professors there allowed differences. But what I have seen over the years, it happens everywhere. And, and even today, I would say, uh, Southern Baptist Seminary and, and the Southern Baptist Seminary is very conservative, Christ-centered Southern Baptist Seminary in New Orleans. I mean, it, uh, New Orleans is good, but it, so, it South, it, uh, Louisville, probably the only thing Southern Baptist, when you look at that, is in the name. This, that gentleman's, uh, uh, Moeller, Al Moeller, is focused on training and equipping people. By the way, you don't have to go there. You can do what you guys are doing. Real quickly, parenthetically, tell them what you're doing. Uh, so Stand up so back and hear you. Tell them who you are, Jordan. I'm uh, Jordan Brown. I'm, I'm a teacher at Connecticut. He teaches at Linfield. Yeah. I'm studying uh, theology at Biola online. Online. <laughs> so I just want to encourage all of you, whether you want to get the final degree in it, go for it. I teach down there at Azusa. In fact, if you want to teach Greek, come on with me this fall. I'd love to have you. But the point being, guys and gals, Oh my gosh, the missionary to India, mother, you got his book. William Carey. William Carey was a cobbler. He made shoes. And he taught himself the biblical language and all other kind of stuff. Ended up leaving. He didn't go to college. He had to, couldn't do it. And he ended up going to India. God used him basically to reach that country for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible? Amen. Hallelujah. So the, don't, don't listen. Charles Spurgeon, he didn't even go to Bible college, and yet he read and studied, taught himself. Are you with me? Yes. So if you don't have that opportunity, schooling, you can do it on your own. Is it hard? Yes, it's hard. Is it difficult? Yes, it's difficult. Is it demanding? Yes, it's demanding. But through Christ, you can do it. Okay? I just want to put that out to you. All right. But we need to be informed. Praise God that you've got a pastor that understands that and is ministering to you that. And it's one right over here as well. Okay, she cannot even see the uh, her hypocrisy because her own narcissistic self-deification of herself and her position won't allow any disagreement because it, it would it expose the falsity of her claims. In other words, I, I could go on down the road there. That's what all this stuff is about. But come down there to the bottom. 
Jesus said that we who are believers are the salt and light in the decaying and darkened world. And therefore, if we do not take a stand against such lies, distortions, tyranny, and darkness, no one else will. Indeed, we may be the only Bible that some of these people will ever see being lived out before them. And if we do not speak the truth to them, then who will? Like that guy at the gym I told you about. I always see, oh, blah, 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 blah. I said, yes, yes, that's right. But let me just tell you this, blah, 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 blah. And I just say it lovingly, smilingly, and then I walk on my way. And I pray for him all the time. I see what God's doing. Okay, <clears throat> we'll finish up with this last quote, and then we'll take a break, then we'll hit the conclusion, and we'll be done. Christians should be involved in every area of society and education as teachers, administrators. We have teachers here, administrators, board members, textbook and selection committee members, and government as leaders in the local, state, federal livers, artists developing the best art in every way, writing books, producing cutting-edge movies. By the way, one of our former teachers, David Dietrich, is a pastor here in, in Temecula, and he just get, did a movie. Yeah. Powerful. We were there the other night. I got to see a former martial arts buddy as an actor in that. I mean, that was incredible. I mean, you know, uh, so, hey, listen, God, is, don't limit God to what he, how he wants to use you, all right? Writing books, producing cutting-edge movies, I just said that. Uh, in families, in loving parents, role models, communities, business leaders, civic club members, <sighs> members, I'm sorry, in the media, reporters, writers, blah, 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 everything. Are you with me? God's called us to be sight, oh, sight and lot. God's called us to be salt and light. I'm really tired. <laughs> All right, he's called us to be light and salt. That's what he's called us to be. All right, any questions on this or answers or comments or anything? But, okay, I'll tell you what, let's take a little break here for about a 10-minute thing here, and then we'll come back. We'll hit the conclusion. And we will be done. And then, Brother Rick, whatever you want to share, whatever, okay. By the way, some of you have asked about different things. He, back here on the back, if you go back here to the back page, you have the bibliography there. Let me just say a little bit about that bibliography. All, these, uh, all the sources that are used are in here. And some of these things are really good. You can go through there and look at them and check them out yourself. You're welcome to do that. If you go there, avoid the picture on the last page there. But anyway, if you go there to the, the, the thing there, he has my website, uh, wordandlife.com. You can go there and pick up anything you want. If, and, and if you want to email me, whatever you're welcome to do. But let's take a little, little break here, and we'll get it back in about 10 minutes, okay?